Thanks. Thanks, Emilia. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to see all of you face to face. And those watching the live stream, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Yuri. I'm a data scientist in a threat research group in Imperva. Um, Imperva is a cybersecurity company, a leading cybersecurity company that's been around for uh, about 20 years, focusing on data and application security. Uh, we provide our customers a wealth of uh, solutions like web application firewall, DDoS protection, client-side protection, account takeover prevention, uh, and more. Um, today, I'm going to tell you about one of our recent uh, projects uh, that combines uh, research in uh, security and machine learning. Uh, and this uh, project is about classifying uh, pieces of code into obfuscated and clear text ones. So let's start. So the motivation is uh, clearly to help our customers to prevent attacks. And one uh, of ways to do so is to concentrate on a client side perspective. So um, a typical website has many, many resources. Most of them are totally harmless, but uh, there could be several malicious ones if uh, attackers manage to inject them into the website. And the question is how, how we find them and how we distinguish between those. Uh, so since a website has many, many resources, this is something that clearly cannot be done, done manually. And moreover, even semi-automatically uh, semi is not good enough. We need a totally automatic, automated process to do that. Uh, so let's take a simple example of, of, of resources and, and, and see how, how it looks. So here uh, we have um, a piece of code in JavaScript, which is actually a keylogger. So you can see, I'm not sure if you can see my laser, but anyway, here above you can see the command and control endpoint, which is example.com. Uh, you can see that we are listening to key down events, and uh, we're sending the data to the command control uh, back uh, every, every 10 seconds. And now let's take a look at another piece of code. So it looks really similar. You can see that the command control endpoint here is missing, and you can see that we're listening to the same event and we uh, just log in it uh, locally once every, every hour. So I just highlighted the difference here for you. And as you can see, uh, for this very, very simple example, almost trivial example, the differences are very subtle. So it requires really uh, tedious work uh, to, to even spot them and attention to the tiniest of details. Um, as, as I said, in Imperva, we're interested in this problem. And, and uh, an example is our client-side protection product, which uh, enables our customers to look on the resources on the website and, uh, and see which, which ones are potentially harmful. And uh, we provide uh, several uh, scores and several uh, data for those resources so the customers can really understand what's going on. Um, and as you saw in this really trivial example, um, this, this problem is re re really difficult for humans. Um, and the question is whether it is solvable at all for machines. And, and by machines, I mean, of course, in machine learning sense. Um, so uh, uh, j just one more word about this. So uh, before this project, uh, the way we tackled it was to use the best data we have in a company and to uh, calculate reputation uh, for uh, IPs and domains and combine all this data in rule-based method, uh, in, in rule-based uh, techniques. Uh, and, and that's how we, uh, we provided this, this scores. Um, so now back to our story. When we see uh, you know, a difficult problem, um, what do we do? 
Uh, well, we search for an easier one. And, and this is, of course, for dramatization purposes only for this presentation. So an easier problem, which, I, which I'll just explain in a second why it is at all related, is obfuscation. So uh, for those of you who never heard of it before, obfuscation is, uh, is an interesting thing. The theoretical foundations of it go deep in computer science and the computational complexity. But uh, if you are down to earth a bit, it's just a family of algorithms rhythms of techniques that uh, make transformation on your code. They take your code and then transform it so it preserves the functionality and hopefully the, the right time, but it really hides the inner structure in a way that people find it very difficult to understand and it makes it almost unintelligible uh, to, to humans to, to really understand what's going on. So let's, let's take an example. So this is like the most trivial piece of, of code in JavaScript you could think of. It's just uh, you know printing hello world to the console log. And when I take this piece of code and obfuscate it using one of the readily available tools in the internet, uh, we, we end up with, with all this and uh, actually even all this too. So you may say, well, this is ridiculous. This is probably some contrived example. But, but, uh, but you are wrong. Uh, and, and the reason is that I, I just used a tool with the lowest obfuscation possible um, in this specific tool, which is Obfuscator IO. And if I would use uh, this tool with the highest level of obfuscation, uh, we would end up with many, many pages that I would have to show you here. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is a real world example. And this is really how obfuscation work uh, just for for this trivial piece of code. Imagine what happens when your code really does something interesting. Um, so, uh, and, and of course, the question is, how is it all this is related to maliciousness? Because remember, we started with maliciousness. Um, so the answer is that it depends on the language. Uh, so um, the, the thing with, um, with obfuscation on a client side, for example, in JavaScript, is that sometimes it can be used for legitimate purposes, for example, for preserving intellectual property. If you want to, to hide your code because you invested uh, a lot of time developing it and there is nothing malicious there. Uh, and there are a few, more, a few additional reasons. Uh, but uh, on, the client, on the server side, uh, these two, two problems are really uh, closely related because usually you don't have to protect your code from hackers on the server side if you don't you know, move it anywhere and do not give it to anyone. Uh, and still, uh, if we look on these two uh, domains together, client side and server side, uh, still uh, obfuscation is a very, very interesting signal that usually helps us to determine maliciousness of, the, of this piece of code. Um, Okay, so, so what we want to do from this point on is to classify every JavaScript document into clear text or obfuscated. Um, and the question is, is it easy for humans? So let's look on another example. Um, I hope you can see, I hope it's not too small, I try to make it as large as possible, take a few moments to try to understand what, what it does, if you, if you will. And uh, then, of course, we have another piece. Um, look pretty similar, aren't they? OK, so without you know, torturing you too much. Um, this is uh, a, a part of, uh, of a malicious script that I took. Um, and, and this is indeed obfuscated. Uh, and, and this part, the first one, is, uh, is actually a clear text. This is a part of a script from, uh, uh, from YouTube that is um, uh, used to speed up um, uh, the, if you embed a piece of YouTube in your, on your website. So this is the code that, uh, just, just a, par a small part of this code that uses to speed it up. And, and this is probably um, calculate some hash function or, or, or things like that. So 
Um, as you saw, it's not really, uh, it's not really easy to, to distinguish between the two cases for humans. And actually, it turns out that it might take a lot of time for a seasoned security researcher. And the reason is uh, that in order to uh, decide if the code is obfuscated or clear text, what, what this researcher does usually is uh, really trying to understand what the code does. It's not just trying to see, I mean, the, the, it's not written anywhere, you know, it's obfuscated or not. We, we need to understand what the code really does, and sometimes it takes time. So uh, it's clearly something that is unscalable in, in, any, in any way. Um, so the question is, uh, is it uh, easy for machines? And of course, we didn't jump into the machine learning solution uh, right away. We, we tried uh, working with heuristics. And it turns out that heuristics are not good enough simply because they are too specific. And we will talk about the various obfuscators in a few moments, and uh, you might uh, then understand why. Um, so the mission from this point on is to build a machine learning classifier for this problem. So I'll tell you about several approaches from the literature we could uh, use. Um, so the first approach is a classical one. Uh, there is a paper by uh, Tellenbach and, uh, and several additional researchers from 2016 where they propose to do a classical feature engineering, meaning to extract uh, things like average length of line, uh, frequency of specific words, specific characters, and then uh, build a decision tree. So I guess you've heard about these kind of trees. And here is a simple example. Uh, so um, this, this tree is checking whether the average length of line is larger than some threshold. And if it is, it then checks the frequency of certain character. And if, and if it exceeds this threshold, for example, it says that the script is obfuscated. Of course, this is a really simple example, but just to get you understand the, the principle. Um, another approach was suggested by um, Skolka and uh, uh, his friends in, in uh, 2019. They suggested to build a deep learning classifier based on uh, convolutional neural networks and abstract syntax trees. So uh, convolutional neural network, just in a sentence, is, um, is um, a method used uh, a lot in vision, but today it also used in additional fields in, in deep learning. And the abstract syntax trees is uh, you can uh, uh, easily download a tool that takes your script, the JavaScript uh, in this in our case, and uh, the and builds out of it the syntax tree for uh, for the script, where you can see the structure and you can extract many interesting features out of this tree. And then these features are fed into the network. Um, of these guys. And the last possible approach is uh, natural languages processing. So in the recent years, we, we see a really a tremendous uh, advances in this, uh, in this field. We, we see uh, um, amazing models that understand human language and uh, enable us to, to solve a multitude of tasks, for example, uh, question answering and, and um, um, text classification and many more. So, um, so uh, in our case, what we can do with it, we can take a model, BERT is just an example, to use the weights uh, that uh, the model was trained on, and then we train it on downstream tasks, may, uh, namely our task. We just feed it documents uh, which are JavaScript, classified into clear text or obfuscated ahead of time, and then the model learns it and adjusts the weights uh, that it had learned uh, previously. Um, so our first approach was uh, inspired by the by the first work. We started simple. We wanted to make a, to build a simple model, and we want to benefit from decision trees that enable us to gain explainability. It can uh, when we use a decision tree, it's very easy to see really which features are affecting the model and how. Um, so we took something about 40 features, and uh, we trained on a single obfuscator. And it turns out that this model didn't gen generalize. Um, so what went wrong? Uh, in order to understand that, we have to dive a bit deeper into the various obfuscators for JavaScript. 
So here, I prepared a list of the most used obfuscators for JavaScript, sorted by the popularity metric of uh, GitHub, which is the number of forks. As you can see, uh, Uglify.js and Obfuscator.io are the most used ones. And there are additional ones uh, here. Um, so what methods uh, do these obfuscators uh, employ? Let's see a few examples. So the first thing uh, people immediately think of when they think of obfuscation is renaming of variables and functions. And indeed, if you think uh, of your code, if you rename it a bit, sometimes it makes it clearly unintelligible. Uh, even before, it might be not really uh, easy to understand. So in this simple example, you can see we just rename a few things, and it already looks a, a bit more intimidating. Um, Additional technique is modification of functions, uh, function calls, the function arguments, and the return values. Uh, so in this simple example, I just took a function that just squares a number, and I show you a snippet of the code. It's not the whole code that was, uh, uh, that was produced up after obfuscating it, but you can clearly see that uh, the function gets many parameters and returns many things, and it's really complicated things a lot. Additional key example is uh, modification of strings uh, by using uh, encoding, uh, encryption, and string generators. So in this example, we have a simple variable. And uh, if we want to, to find the strings that were used inside of it, like it's you know, the, the Honda Accord car, you can see that the strings are splitted. And then uh, several um, arithmetic operations are used. And if you look on the resulting code wi without having seen the clear text one ahead of time, it really takes time to understand what's, what happens there. And, and, and the last example in this context is the manipulation of constants. So if we have a simple constant, we might end up with uh, some expression which we need to calculate to, to understand what the constant is. And there are additional methods like changing the base of integers and injecting a dead or redundant code, which, of course, uh, you know, it's clear what it does. Uh, complicates things a lot. So what are the differences between those, uh, those obfuscators and, in general, between the obfuscators? So the differences are, as you might imagine, specific renaming methods, the, the, the encoding and encryption functions that, that are used, and some more. So moreover, uh, most of these obfuscators can receive a lot of parameters to tweak them, and the, the, resulting, uh, the, resulting, uh, the resulting code uh, looks, much, lo looks very different if you run a single obfuscator in mode uh, 1 versus mode 2. So uh, just an example for, for JavaScript obfuscator, it has 40 parameters, and the Uglify.js has 30 parameters. So uh, as you might imagine, uh, when we uh, compare between different obfuscators that clearly uh, the, the output distribution looks different. And in, 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 uh, if we think about distributions, so uh, we get different um, everything that you, that you like. Average length of line, length of word, uh, function size, uh, proportion of encoded characters. And in general, this is just an example. If we want to uh, measure the normalized backslash count, which is one of the features that was proposed in the paper that I mentioned before, or average length of line, you can see that the differences between the obfuscators can be really big. And this is log scale, by the way. So before uh, telling you about the approach that really worked for us, I just say a few words about the data we trained the model on. Uh, so we used a public data set of about 150,000 JavaScripts. All of them are clear text. And we applied four different obfuscators of them, and, and four because we wanted to uh, test the model on additional three that the, that the model has previously not seen. Uh, and we, um, we got a perfectly balanced data set of about 100,000 clear text JavaScripts and 100,000 obfuscated JavaScripts equally divided between the, uh, uh, between the obfuscators. So um, our approach combined uh, approaches number one and three that I mentioned. Uh, and, and, and the idea is as follows. We tokenize the input into words, and we calculate 
the most common words in the ClearText JavaScript. So we take all the ClearText JavaScript, we extract the common words of, uh, out of it, and look on several hundreds of them. And then for every input, we measure the difference between this input and this, uh, up, uh, and this calculated distribution. So let me give you a small example. So assume that the top three words in JavaScript are function, document, and input, and assume that like function appears about once in every 20 words, document once in every like 33 words, and input like once in every 100 words. So if we have following JavaScript, and, and if it's too small, I'm sorry, but you don't have to see the exact details. I will just read them out for you. Um, so here we have 71 words. And uh, if we look on the word function, it appears twice, meaning it appears in 3% of the cases. The word document appears once, and the word input appears and uh, never appears. So if we calculate the difference between the clear test occurrence, we calculate it as I showed you in the previous slide, and the actual occurrence, we can see the differences in red. So um, what do we do with these differences? So we, we feed them into a boosted decision tree. And this is very similar to the example that I gave you before. Uh, and then we just look on the differences between uh, the specific word, how, how uh, many times it appears, and then uh, we can know whether the text is obfuscated or clear text. So I hope this, this, this is clear. This is just an example of decision tree with the different features. Every feature corresponds to a top word we extracted from uh, the ClearText JavaScript. So it turned out that the performance of our model is, is uh, pretty good. Uh, we were mainly interested in this case in false negatives and false positives. You can see that both of them are less than 1% uh, about that. Th this was the uh, product requirement. And specifically, uh, we wanted, uh, so, so what's false negative in this case? False negative means that we are classifying some document as uh, clear text when in reality it is obfuscated, and false positive means we, calc we classify a document as obfuscated, where in reality it's clear text. So uh, we were interested in, in, a, in a case where false negative rate is smaller than the false positive rate, and the meaning is, uh, since remember, uh, as, you, as you recall, as I said, it's related to maliciousness, so we do not want to flag uh, cases where uh, people would look and say, oh, in reality, it, not obfuscated, uh, so we don't want to, um, you know, to increase the number of these cases. Um, and the next question we asked whether uh, our approach is generalizable to additional languages, and uh, it turns out that that the answer is yes. So we looked on Python and PHP, for example. As I mentioned before, they are uh, closer to, um, uh, so, so the case for these languages, since they're server-side, is um, that uh, obfuscation and maliciousness are closely related to one another. And, um, and th th this is why, in these in this cases, it's even more interesting. Uh, and we got really good results. Of course, we trained these uh, models on, on the specific data set that were chosen for these languages. Uh, so let me show you just a, a very, very short demo. Uh, this is the QR code you can scan. So we set up a website uh, that uh, you can use. It's publicly available uh, with some version of our model. Um, and you can just play with it and see, and see what's, uh, what's, what's, what's going on. So if we take... Uh, this script as example, you can see it's uh, non-obfuscated, okay? So we can just take it, we can feed it into our model. This is, by the way, a live demo. So um, you can see that the model says that this is a clear text with prob probability 0 0.95, uh, meaning the model is pretty certain. And uh, here you can see a sharp values. 
Uh, I I'm, I'm, don't have time to explain what, what they really are. They are just the significance of features that affected the decision. So in this case, you can see uh, an, an example of one gram model, which is a model a bit different of what I described before. It's one of, of our models that we uh, uh, built during the development of this project. And um, if we take another example, just, just a quick one. Um, so I took, I took um, a piece of code and uh, obfuscated it. So you can see that, um, I, I'm not sure you can see, unfortunately the window is a bit small here, but uh, you have to trust me on that. Uh, so if we feed the code here, then um, it says that it's obfuscated. Of course, the probability is rounded. Um, and uh, you can also see the various features and how they affected the decision. So um, I, I cannot promise that this, um, this website will, will remain in this, uh, in this exact form, but if people are uh, you know, interested and, and will use it, we might enhance it and we might uh, uh, continue uh, uh, maintaining it. So what, are, uh, what, what have we learned in this, uh, in, in this um, uh, project? So the first thing is uh, about the relationship between maliciousness and obfuscation in different languages. As I mentioned, it's not a one-to-one -one relation, but usually obfuscation is a strong signal for maliciousness, and uh, it's really cool because uh, I think that solving the obfuscation uh, classification problem is much easier than solving the, the maliciousness one in terms of uh, machine learning, of course. Um, so we saw that uh, classifying code, we saw uh, many problems that are difficult for humans, uh, but even the, co even the problem which, which, mine, uh, which might uh, seem simple of classifying the code into obfuscated or, or clear text uh, is, not, is not so easy. And, um, and uh, as we saw, uh, building a machine learning model that solves it is relatively not very sophisticated and not too hard. Um, another thing is about the obfuscators. So we had uh, several choices here. Building a machine learning model per obfuscator is not scalable, and looking on the internals of each obfuscator is not scalable. So we use this, uh, you can call it a trick or approach, of looking on the clear text, extracting the top words out of them, which is uh, inspired by uh, natural languages processing. Uh, approach and um, and and this this is uh, really enabled us to solve this problem. Uh, and another nice thing is uh, that this framework seems general, so we didn't test it on all languages. But I think Python, PHP, and JavaScript are like the more the most interesting interesting one in terms of obfuscation. Um, and there is no reason to believe that this wouldn't work for additional languages. Of course, if you train uh, the model on a large enough data set that is uh, uh, properly balanced. So thank you so much. I uh, am looking forward to your questions. Hope you uh, enjoy the talk. Mm -hmm.